Welcome to a summary on all you need to know about explorers or boys messing about, which is an article that appeared in the Guardian newspaper by a man called Stephen Morris. Now, my name is Barbara and in this video, I'll read and explain in depth this article. However, do bear in mind that the version that I will read is what appears in the Pearson International GCSE anthology. Now, I'll explain the meaning related to this text by looking at different language devices and doing a lot of word level analysis, and I'll point out things that you will find helpful as you study this text and, of course, as you prepare to write about it. So let's get started. Now, do bear in mind that this text is adapted from an article that was published in the Guardian newspaper on the 28th of January 2003. Now, what this text essentially talks about is a helicopter duo who are plucked from a life raft after an Arctic crash, or rather an Antarctic crash. So what I will do is I'll read the passage as we go through it and then highlight word level analysis that you need to be aware of. So now I'm going to begin by reading this passage and then afterwards I will go over literary techniques and language techniques that you need to be aware of. The last expedition ended in farce when the Russians threatened to send in military planes to intercept them as they tried to cross into Siberia via the ice round Bering Strait. Yesterday, a new adventure undertaken by British explorers Steve Brooks and Quentin Smith almost led to a tragedy when their helicopter plunged into the sea off Antarctica. The men were plucked from the icy water by a Chilean naval ship after a nine-hour rescue which began when Mr Brooks contacted his wife Jo Vesti on his satellite phone asking for assistance. The rescue involved the Royal Navy, the RAF and the British Coast Guards. Last night there was resentment in some quarters that the men's adventure had cost the taxpayers of Britain and Chile tens of thousands of pounds. Experts questioned the wisdom of taking a small helicopter the four-seater Robinson R44 has a single engine, into such a hostile environment. There was confusion about what exactly the men were trying to achieve. A website set up to promote the Bering Strait expedition claims the team were planning to fly from the North to South Pole in their trusty helicopter. But Mrs Vesti claimed that she did not know what the pair were up to, describing them as boys messing about with a helicopter. Now let's stop there first off and let's look at how this article begins. So of course, just to be clear, the first paragraph opens with a complex sentence and it starts like a report. And of course, if we know that this article ended up in the Guardian newspaper, of course, this is a report for a national newspaper about these two men in particular. Then the report highlights or rather this article highlights key terms expedition and farce and this is really interesting there's a semantic contrast in these two terms so of course expedition is something that's quite large very adventurous very inspiring however the term farce which is basically uh, a silly outcome something that is very um, silly essentially shows that this expedition was just something that should never have happened so this article already we can sense in the underlying tone that it's really critical of these men that they're going to be talking about. Also, pay attention to the semantic field of nationalities that are mentioned. There are Russians, British and Chileans involved. So this shows just how farcical this whole expedition was, but also how much it cost in terms of manpower and all the different people globally that were impacted by these men's actions. Now, of course, in the second paragraph, we are told who these men were. So this is Steve Brooks and Quentin Smith. And of course, this these proper nouns really place focus and emphasis on these men. Furthermore, the active verb plunge really shows how drastically this adventure, this massive, massive exploration turned almost into tragedy. Now, of course, the specific jargon that's used in this article is related to a specific part of Antarctica. And of course, there's this jargon really enforces the geography of where this event happened. Furthermore, the writer points out the Royal Navy, the RAF and the British Coast Guards. And this listing emphasizes the sheer size of the rescue mission, the sheer amount of resources and manpower that was used when it came to rescuing these two men. And of course, part of the resentment comes from a lot of people who are wondering, why do they even go out on this really dangerous mission? 
Furthermore, this adverbial phrase of time now shifts back. And of course, what this article does is it highlights how a lot of people are really angered by the actions of Steve Brooks and Quentin Smith. Furthermore, this hyperbole and of course alliteration, so tens of thousands of pounds, this emphasizes just how much this rescue mission, which really was not necessary at all, this whole expedition was not necessary, it was never needed, how much it ultimately cost taxpayers in both Britain and Chile. Furthermore, the mention of what these men used to go into this really hostile environment, a small helicopter, this pre-modifier small, shows just how inadequate the helicopter was. And of course, again, there is an underlying critical tone in the journalist's report, which shows that, you know, these men, well, they, do they even know what they were doing? Why do they do this? Furthermore, again, there's specific technical detail related to this helicopter. And throughout this article, there's a lot of jargon that shows, of course, the author, so the person that's written this newspaper article, Stephen Morris, really knows what he's talking about. So it reinforces, of course, the integrity of this article and it reinforces our trust in the article as readers. But ultimately, also the specific technical detail really shows the mistakes that these two men made. Furthermore, this intensifies such a hostile environment shows this wisdom was really, really lacking in their decision to take this small helicopter to, into such a vast expedition. Moreover, the negative adjective hostile shows that these men should have known better than to take the small helicopter and to engage in this expedition that really nobody requested and it's cost people a lot of money. Furthermore, the personification of the website, which claims that they were planning to fly from the North Pole to the South Pole, as well as the inverted commas trusty helicopter, really is the writer's way of mocking what these men were doing and, you know, these grandiose claims that they had, which ultimately ended really badly. Moreover, the diminutive common noun, boys, really makes them seem to be almost people who didn't have that much power, they didn't know what they were doing, so maybe we should forgive them. It takes agency and power away from these men, which of course is the opposite. These men knew what they were doing, but they just didn't pay attention to the safety in what they were doing. Moreover, there's colloquial language, and of course, this is related to what the wife of one of the men, so Mrs. Vesti, she's saying, oh, they were just messing about. Again, it downplays their actions, it downplays that. They actually wasted a lot of people's resources, a lot of people's time, and of course, ultimately cost taxpayers a lot of money. Let's carry on. The drama began at around 1 a.m. British time when Mr. Brooks, 42, and 40-year-old Mr. Smith, also known as Q, ditched into the sea 100 miles off Antarctica, about 35 miles north of Smith Island, and scrambled into their life, life raft. Mr. Brooks called his wife in London on his satellite phone. She said, he said they were both in the life raft, but were okay, and could I call the emergency tele people? Meanwhile, distress signals were being beamed from the ditched helicopter and from Mr. Brooks's break-leg emergency watch, a wedding present. The signals from the aircraft were deciphered by a Falmouth Coast Guard and passed on to the Rescue Coordination Centre at RAF Kinsloss in Scotland. The Royal Navy's ice patrol ship, HMS Endurance, which was 180 miles away surveying uncharted waters, began steaming towards the scene and dispatched its two Lynx helicopters. One was driven back because of poor visibility, but the second was on its way when the men were picked up by a Chilean naval vessel about 10.20 a.m. British time. Though the pair wore survival suits and the weather at the spot where they ditched was clear, one Arctic explorer told Mr. Brooks's wife it was nothing short of a miracle that they had survived. Both men are experienced adventurers. Mr. Brooks, a property developer from London, has taken part in expeditions to 70 countries in 15 years. He has trekked solo to Everest Base Camp and walked barefoot for three days in the Himalayas. So I'll pause here for now and let's look at some of the language that's used between these lines. So, of course, the hyperbole drama to talk about uh, what's happened, this failed expedition, again, shows that these men caused a lot of chaos. 
Furthermore, the mention and the more specific detail that we get of Mr. Brooks, who's 42, and Mr. Smith, who's 40. These formal proper nouns, so Mr. Brooks and Mr. Smith, coupled with their ages, we know that they're 42 and 40, not exactly young, is of course a contrast to the previous mention of boys. This is the journalist's way of putting agency back in their hands and to show that, no, these people knew what they were doing and they were making mistakes that really they shouldn't have been making. Furthermore, the active voice that's used, so of course they ditched into the sea and they scrambled for their life. This active voice, again, it's it's deliberately chosen to really put blame on these men and to also show the power that they had. Furthermore, the adjectives, distressed and ditched, and of course the alliteration in these adjectives, emphasise how these men are misusing government resources. Furthermore, the mention of Mr. Brooks's bright leg emergency watch, so that pre-modifies bright leg and emergency. If you know about watches, these are particularly expensive watches. This is an indirect hint and a dig at the men's wealth and social status. They could have afforded to use better resources to make sure that their expedition didn't end up in such a massive disaster. Furthermore, the mention of the Falmouth Coast Guard. So Falmouth is a part in the southern part of England and RAF Kinsloss. So these are mention of really official government departments. And so now these men who misjudged this expedition are now making the government get involved and use all of its resources. Furthermore, the acronyms RAS and HMS, or rather RAF and HMS, essentially lend credibility to this article. The journalist knows what he's writing about, but of course also this again, these are both official government departments. It's showing how serious this expedition and this uh, issue became. Furthermore, uh, the mention of statistics 100 mile and 80 miles. Always remember that when journalists use things like statistics, what this does is it lends credibility to what they're writing. It shows that indirectly to us that they know what they're writing about. So of course, this is showing that the journalist has done his homework and he knows exactly what happened as tragedy struck. Furthermore, the present continuous verb, steaming, highlights how quick the British government was in acting and how quick they were to rescue these men. However, also the Chileans were also very quick to act because the men were picked up by a Chilean naval vessel. So what this is also showing is they both had plenty of options which they selfishly exploited. On the one hand, they had the British government which would look after them, but also there was the Chilean government that they could also count on to look after them. Again, this is showing the perhaps indirectly the journalist's own opinion that actually these men were not being quite fair in using all of these resources. Furthermore, the sibilance here, which highlights that they wore survival suits, show that these men also could have easily survived this calamity. Furthermore, where they mentioned that the weather at the spot where they ditched was clear, shows that even if they sunk, where they were staying was mild and temperate. So the, really, they did have time to wait on either the British or the Chileans to act. However, they didn't want to wait, so they just rushed to call anybody and everyone who could come and rescue them. Furthermore, the speech marks, which quote one Arctic explorer that this rescue was nothing short of a miracle, actually adds a mocking tone. It really wasn't a miracle. These men would have survived anyway. Moreover, this simple sentence, both men are experienced adventurers, really emphasises and focuses our attention on how these two men should have known better. They know exactly what they were doing and they've had lots of other expeditions and other massive journeys that they've embarked on, which they know how to manage. And of course, this should this was all completely preventable. Furthermore, the mention of mountains. So this is a semantic field of mountains, Everest and Himalayas. These are two really, really vast mountain ranges. What this shows is just how extensive these men's experience was. So let's continue. He has negotiated the white water rapids of the Zambezi River by the kayak and survived a charge by a silverback gorilla in the Congo. He is also a qualified mechanical engineer and pilot. He and his wife spent their honeymoon flying the helicopter from Alaska to Chile. The 16,000 mile trip took three months. 
Mr. Smith, also from London, claims to have been flying since the age of five. He was twice, he has twice flown a helicopter around the globe and won World Freestyle Helicopter Flying Championship. Despite their experience, this is not the first time they've hit the headlines for the wrong reasons. In April, Mr. Brooks and other explorer, Graham Stratford, were poised to become the first to complete a crossing of the 56-mile wide frozen Bering Strait between the US and Russia in an amphibious vehicle, Snowboard 6, which could carve its way through ice flows and float in the water in between. But they were forced to call a halt after the Russian authorities told them they would scramble military helicopters to lift them off the ice if they cross the border. Ironically, one of the aims of this expedition, for which Mr. Smith provided air backup, was to demonstrate how good relations between East and West had become. So of course, what the author does is now go into more specific detail about not only how experienced both Mr. Smith and Mr. Brooks are, but also just how much personal wealth and personal resources that they have at hand. But instead of using the personal wealth, the personal resources, they then still wasted government resources. So the mention of the Zambezi River in Africa as well as Congo, these locations show that these men have faced far more dangerous situations. This is more specifically relating to Mr. Brooks. Furthermore, we learn that Mr. Brooks is a qualified mechanical engineer and pilot, and these pre-modifiers show his qualification as well as his wealth and privilege. Moreover, the pronouns, the third person pronoun he and his, and of course it's relating to both himself but also his wife, show that his wife is one of his possessions. And of course, again, this is really the availed way of the journalist showing just how much privilege and wealth and power that these men have, but still they are abusing this in, of course, using government resources. The journalist highlights that they went, they spent their honeymoon flying the helicopter from Alaska to Chile. And of course, the alliteration emphasizes the class and privilege. They have this really fancy honeymoon in a helicopter and they go to an exotic destination. They go to both Alaska and Chile. And of course, this again emphasizes these people are people of means. Now, the alliteration have hit the headlines, hit and headlines emphasizes the notoriety of both men. And of course, all this is doing is really making us as readers have a negative opinion of these two men. So really we're getting a case being built up of these men, we're getting a composite picture of their backgrounds and how they just carelessly flaunt their privilege, but also they carelessly use resources that are limited. They're using government resources when they have a lot of personal wealth, which they could have used to rescue themselves. Furthermore, the mention of specific jargon, as I mentioned throughout this article, the journalist uses a lot of jargon. So in this case, amphibious vehicle, Snowbird the Sixth, shows that the journalist knows exactly what he's talking about and exactly what these men have used. Furthermore, when he mentions, ironically, one of the main aims of the expedition was to have and to show good relations between East and West. This injects the writer's criticism. It shows just how these men have this grandiose view of themselves, how amazing they are, and they have a lot of power to even globally unite the East and the West. And of course, West and East, this is cynic doke. This is a word, these are two words that represent, of course, countries like Russia from the East, and of course, the UK and the US from the West. And politically speaking, both of these um, sides have not necessarily historically gotten on. So these men had these grandiose views of trying to create world peace by doing all of these different expedi expeditions. But of course, this is a journalist's way of mocking them and of showing just how out of touch they really are. Let's carry on. The wisdom of the team's latest adventure was questioned by, among others, Gunter Endres, editor of Jane's Helicopter Markets and Systems, said... I'm surprised they used the R44. I wouldn't use a helicopter like that to go so far over the sea. It sounds as if they were pushing it to the maximum. A spokesman for the pair said it was not known what had gone wrong. The flying conditions had been excellent. The Ministry of Defence said the taxpayer would pick up the bill, as was normal in rescues in the UK and abroad. The spokesman said it was highly unlikely it would recover any of the money. Last night, the men were on their way to the Chilean naval base Eduardo Frey, where HMS Endurance was to pick them up. Mrs. Vesti said, They've been checked and appear to be well. I don't know what will happen to them once they have been picked up by HMS Endurance. They'll probably have the bottoms kicked and be sent home the long way. 
So now the journalist repeats the abstract noun wisdom. So this word was used actually in line 12 and this is repeated again. And of course, this shows just how actually what these men did was the opposite of wisdom. It was actually very silly and foolhardy. So of course, this, this article is extremely critical of their actions. Furthermore, the idiom the taxpayer picking up the bill. This emphasizes how angry most ordinary people are for picking up the bill for what, something that very rich people have done. These men have caused chaos, they've caused problems, and they won't really have to be accountable for it. They don't have to pay for this because it's taxpayers that will pay for their rescue. And of course, their privilege is even emphasized in line 60. They have a spokesman. These are people who have a lot of resources to be able to do and to even rescue themselves, but they're not going to do so. And of course, also this anecdote here, the bill, of course, this refers to the government resources and the money that the government has expended in rescuing them. The article ends by citing what one of the wives says. Uh, she states, they'll probably have the bottoms kicked. And of course, this colloquial language really highlights that the punishment that these men face is probably going to be quite light and they are probably highly likely to commit other future transgressions. They're, they're likely to continue what they keep on doing and therefore, you know, taxpayers are just going to have to suck it up and accept their actions for what it is. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you found this video useful in your learning and do make sure you check out our website www.firstrateteachers.com there you will find lots of useful revision resources for your work in English and indeed other subjects. Thank you so much for listening.